I, I feel like the only time I met you was I was doing Indie Chefs. That's event, right. And you were, and we went to your restaurant afterwards. It was like a party. That's right. Um, hmm. Were you like doing something for the event? Or I think you, you, you specifically hosted that, that, the party. for the I event, hosted right? that, that, that party, which was like the first night. It was before the other stuff started. And then we, um, we met there. And then we we did we were together. It was either the next night or the night after at Foreign and Domestic. We did a a dinner there. Um, That's right. Uh, did a course of you and Sergio were both there and <laughs> and uh, yeah. Now I remember. Yeah, there were a bunch of cats there. Um, <laughs> I was trying to think. Like uh, I don't believe Sarah or Nathan. <laughs> I don't. I don't know which one of them was there. Phil Spear was there. Sarah was there. Sarah was there. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Philip was there as well. Yeah, it was. A, it was a. It was. A, it was. A, it was a good event, man. Um. Anyways, I didn't mean to <laughs> throw you on the spot for that, yeah. but uh, still to catch up with you. Likewise, uh, it's been it's been quite a while. But I because I remember specifically when we when I met you, um, I had just learned about Good Work Austin, and I was like, I want to learn more about. Oh, that. cool. And yeah. Then, but I didn't. Yeah. So so I'm gonna to learn today. Nice. So <laughs> we'll talk about that. Um, but if it's cool, before we get into, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about a bunch about your background today, uh, and Austin, um, and your restaurant, of course. Um, but what's severed ways? I went out, <laughs> like doing some research. Mm. My assistant sent me a bunch of stuff over. She sent me, she sent me a link to, uh, IMDB. I'm like, nah, that must be a different Fiora. No, it's um, the same guy. I don't think it is. I think that's yeah, it. Same guy. <laughs> what is um, that? It's, uh, a 10th century period piece. Um, uh, that, uh, a, a small group of us made, um, was directed by a fellow named Tony Stone. It was his idea. And so, so it's a film that, that got released on via magnet pictures. And it was in like, uh, something like a dozen film festivals and won several of them. And, um, I was at a few of them kind of like standing ovation at like the LA film festival, uh, and did talk back at, and then we got uh, it got released uh, via Magnet Films, and we got a New York Times write up on the film. Um, I'm I co-wrote the film and co-starred in it. Um, the credit I I have a you know I got a big fight with Tony. I <laughs> I have a like story by credit because um, right before uh, he got into the final edits, he kind of erased all the text that I wrote and. Uh, dubbed in gibberish it's a, a kind of a, what? yes a kind of wild story but the the heart of it was like i was living uh in the woods um in vermont for like three months out of the year for a couple years making this film with with like four of my best friends um and sort of working full-time as a as an artist and I was going on tour with my band in between shooting, um, that was my life for a couple of years. So this is before you got into food when you were still like, you were a drummer. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I mean, I was into food. I had, uh, I had been, I had cooked on and off and I grew up cooking. I grew yeah. up cooking in, in like, uh, in, uh, hotels and restaurants, um, but was not serious about it. I was not, uh, I was not, gotcha. I no, was not just... in the, you know, the difference of like, oh, this thing's cool. And then the being dialed in and be like, oh, no, yeah, I have, yeah. I have, I'm accountable to something and to someone. Yeah. yeah. So what, why did you want to make this movie and what, wh like, what was the impetus for, 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 for making a movie? Cause they, you, you made one and then you, and then you stopped and thought, <laughs> Got you know, got into food at some point. Yeah. Or more into food. I mean, sense. I was me at the time I was making uh all kinds of weird art projects. I was doing um I was working on like a avant garde dance piece um <laughs> with my with my buddy <laughs> with my buddy Claire, who I was in a band with, and um I I I had I had my bands and then I had like my side projects. I was committed to making just to just expressing all kinds of art. Tony was a fan of, uh, 
one of my bands and asked me to make this movie with him, asked me to write it with him. Uh, and then we thought that Andrew WK was going to be starring in it. Um, and then he pulled out last minute. Um, and so I ended up, um, acting in it. Uh, I was going, I was, yeah. I, so I ended up, Tony and I end up being the lead actors and there's a bunch of real actors in the film as well. Uh, how did that feel acting in, in a movie? I loved it. I loved it. I was all in. I was like super committed to the process, super committed to the whole thing for the couple of years. I was really um, all in, really serious about it. And I thought that, that that was where my life was heading after finished that film and, and t- you know, being at the film festivals and stuff, people are like, oh, you're, uh, uh, I thought I had some, some, momentum as an actor to and and start getting auditions for these uh kind of wild parts that went to real <laughs> uh famous people um uh like real actors um and i didn't get those parts uh after and after several of those auditions i was like this is lame i don't want to do this anymore um <laughs> i feel like a loser you mean like culturally Ju- culturally it was just like not not like- I, it was more like the process of auditioning and not getting parts i'm like i don't know how i don't know how these people live lives like this we're just like i'm asking for the right to work and just keep saying no and then it reminded me of being like 19 and being in the city and i was actually then i was trying to get jobs in real kitchens and getting told no then um Mm-hmm. And that, you know, so when was when was that? So th- th- you say the city, so New York, New York. Yeah, city? I moved. I moved to the city in ninety eight, uh, nineteen ninety eight. Uh huh. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, had a sort of a circuitous path to uh, <laughs> to anything. I worked in. I ended up hustling my way into uh, a stylist assistant job on some retail fashion shoots which turned into um a design i had a i had a fancy design job at victoria's secret for about two and a half years um designing designing interiors um although like uh personally i was a mess and did not know i couldn't like balance a checkbook um and there's just so much volatility i was there was a stretch where i was like working at victoria's secret and had to look the part and kind of was softly lying about uh, my age and my education um i was i was 20 years old um my hr thought i was 28 and graduated from like oberlin i think i told them um because I <laughs> did you did you randomly choose Oberlin as the place? I was like, that sounds like a an art school they're not going to follow up with. Uh, <laughs> but meanwhile, I was like That's homeless, a- living in Washington Square Park. Um, oh my gosh! Because um, I, you know, I got kicked out of my apartment uh, um, after a fight with my roommate. Um, yeah. Um, I had like and I had like no money, had like no prospects, but I had this job, but where I was getting paid like every six weeks as a contractor. So I was just like, well, I have to show up and can you continue to work and I have to look look the park. Uh so I would just sleep at the park uh and pack my leather pants and my silk shirt in a in a bag and wake up and like uh like shower in the sink at Washington Square Park and the guys that played chess over there I knew a little bit and was friendly with so they looked after me at night. Um that's crazy. How long did you do that? Uh for? I did that twice for like 3 weeks at a time. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So so how long was it before what was the period in which you didn't have a place to stay? Um uh, like what year? Like, just uh, not just the time frame. Like, how many how many weeks or months? Oh, it'd be like three weeks, three weeks straight, and then I uh, uh, got in a uh, a volatile situation, got out of again, um, and I was homeless for another couple of weeks. Um, yeah, so about five weeks total. 
Yeah. And I, I didn't, I didn't tell my family. I didn't, I didn't tell, I, I was, uh, not talking to any of my friends really. Cause I was kind of, I was pretty lost and I felt like I was, I felt like I was just lying all the time. I was lying to my bosses about who yeah. I was, uh, lying to myself about, um, <laughs> this being a good idea, living the life that I was living. Um, and just, um, I didn't know how to be accountable to myself or anything else. Um, but was just trying to, I was, I was working through kind of a lot of the toughness and unresolved feelings and some of the trauma of like the, of some childhood stuff and, um, trying to like work it out in real time and trying to figure out how to not be self-destructive. You know, it took me a long time to get through a lot of that, but, um, I had to, I had to face some real demons up front with that. Yeah. Um, so, wow. I'm, I have a million questions and I, I, uh, this is, I didn't know so much of this. So th first of all, thanks for sharing yeah. this with me. Um, what, what, what drove you to, to, uh, work in the city, to stay in the city, to decide like, I need to do mm. this and it's okay if I'm, if I don't have a place to stay, I need to do this. What, what was that? You know, what, what was that voice that was, uh, that was, that was pushing you to do that? I had, I was worried that where where I came from, like my family unit was decaying, had decayed. There was a, like a lot of uh, a lot of bad things had happened within my family and were continuing to happen. The prospects within our family unit was not great at the time. It was not positive, and I wonder that was in upstate New York, about three hours north. This was in Troy, Troy. New York, yeah. Intro, yeah. yeah, and um, I was really motivated leaving as a teenager to get out and um, make something of myself. And I was determined that I was going to find myself in the city. I was going to find my people. I was going to find my voice that I had felt kind of miscast growing up in the small town uh, where I just got bullied pretty mercilessly through um, a lot of through all of middle school and. Uh, um, yeah, I was, I was really determined to, to make it work. I had decided years before that I was gonna, I was gonna live in New York city and I was going to be successful. And so I didn't know what any of that meant. And I had to, I had, and I thought I had to grit it out. Um, I didn't have anybody mm -hmm. to lean on or anybody to, you know, if anybody I, I did have, um, in the city, the one person I leaned on that was, uh, consistently showed up for me was uh uh chef uh leanne wong um <clears throat> oh yeah wow what what why leanne? leanne and i grew up together we uh went to the same high school she was two years older than me two grades ahead of me and she worked at a she bartended at a place called dojo in the west village um was like a like a <laughs> another place <laughs> uh nyu like kind of college bar restaurant um Yep. And it was around the corner from where I had been, I had been living. Um, and so I moved to the city and she was my friend and she would feed me and, uh, she, she would, when I hadn't, I would show up there and hadn't, hadn't eaten in a couple of days and she would like, she would feed me and never charge me. Uh, she just took care of me like a big sister. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if she ever knew like the kind of how desperate i was at times going in there um but uh it's a tough thing to to share that with someone too you know um the the, the depth at which things are i think in, in humans in general right we don't we never really share how the, the depth of which we, of, a, of a depression <laughs> or a darkness that we're in with most people you know yeah sure the idea of like showing up and beg hey how are you today hey i'm i feel like i'm really at the uh edge of despair and um <laughs> i don't know if i'm gonna make it but uh uh what do you want to talk about right yeah yeah um wow so 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 you moved you, so you went to new york in 98 and then hmm. how how long um until you so you so 
you, you were obviously in, 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 in this, in this design career. And then you started, um, was, was music, was, was music in the film before it sounds like that was after that, but was there some before and after that? And then what led you to kind of move from music to mm-hmm. more into food and things like that? Yeah. I, I started before I, I was, uh, I, I was playing drums, uh, for different bands as soon as I moved to the city, um, and trying to, uh, I had, I had dropped out of college in, in 98. I, I was at Hofstra university on a tennis scholarship. Um, um, I, I played good tennis, um, but I tore my shoulder apart, uh, <laughs> playing tennis and, um, Long story short, I lost my my scholarship, moved to Florida to try to rehab my shoulder and get another scholarship, and I just tore my shoulder again. Um, moved to the city, um, kind of on a lark uh, to follow through with the earlier promise that I had made to myself. Um, mm-hmm. It had been uh, uh, kind of until... Uh, until 2001 uh there's a really significant change uh to the early january of 2001 i got a a contract uh with lvmh with vuve clico to uh work on the uh branding and um uh design of uh, uh the display packaging for Le Grand Dame, the Vuv Clico Le Grand Dame bottle. If you remember that, that came out in 2001. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I designed this uh, really beautiful display packaging that I bid. I um, I bid for and, and uh, somehow got the contract. I was in way in over my head. And uh, the production of this display, of this whole marketing program was, uh, um, it was a, a uh, half million dollar contract basically um i was 21 and working on this by myself where the the other person that would have won this contract with a was a various uh, like well-known japanese architect with an office of 40 people right <laughs> <laughs> um um it was it was wild that i won it and then uh where the rubber met the road uh, was it was hard getting this thing that I designed produced really beautifully. It was a plexiglass, three plexiglass pieces that aligned and uh, and, and slightly different colors that refracted a rainbow when natural light was shown on it. So in any display place that this was shining the bottle, as soon as natural light hit it, it was shining a rainbow back. Uh, it was a really cool effect um, that I and learned how to do reading, you know, reading design magazines in my office where I was trying mm-hmm. to decide why I had this, how I had this design job and how to justify it. Um, and uh, so I got the contract and then uh, September 11th happens. And it was, you know, I, I that day we were supposed to be delivering 300 of these display pieces to the LVMH offices. Um, uh, in Connecticut, where they were, where the president had flown over to look at these things that I had built, um, and then the packages didn't show up. Um, the, you know, that that was obviously a terrible, terrible day for everyone that was in New York City and then and beyond. So the uh, September 11th, 2001, Twin Towers happened. I was in the middle of kind of this. N- just realizing early, early that, that morning that, um, this job, this contract that I had was about to fall apart. Um, because the, the, the company that was building this piece I designed, um, kind of shit the bed, um, and, and didn't tell me, uh, and were lying about it. And then the twin towers happens wow. and then there's no communication with anybody for several days. We're yeah. just in, um, I'm, I lived on, on Bleecker street. Um, uh, where on Bleecker? On Bleecker and McDougal. Oh, I lived on Bleecker and Thompson then. <laughs> <laughs> we were neighbors almost. Wow. Um, and so over the next, next two weeks, I had stuck around the city trying to rescue this job. 
trying to, but I was also like, I was, I was traumatized, man. That was, that was a, that was a tough time. And, and I yeah. didn't realize how damaging psychologically the effects of everything happened was, um, you know, I was on my, stood on, 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 on the, 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 the roof, the, on the roof of, uh, my building and saw the second tower fall. Um, and my cousin was in the building. He, he got out, um, spent the morning trying to find him, spent the next day and a half trying to find him. Um, yeah, it was wildly traumatizing. My girlfriend, um, that, that, that was like a final fracture in our relationship. We lived together. I was in the middle of losing my mind over this job. I didn't have room to take care of her in that time. She quickly, and she was like, I don't want to be in the States anymore. She's from Brazil. She left Brazil. Um, I got a bleeding ulcer and was just kind of throwing up blood and was in a pretty sickly state. And, uh, I thought I was going to, I, I, I had called the Westchester mental Institute and, and was about to check myself in. And, um, uh, she had been calling from Brazil saying, why don't you just come down here and let my family take care of you instead. Um, and kind of flipped a coin and said, it uh, landed on tails. Tails was Brazil. So I flew to Brazil that night and, wow. and was there for months, uh, was there for several months and, um, kind of just restoring myself, getting well, trying to, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, came back to New York months later, um, got together with my, my cousin who is now just graduating. Um, we had gr grown up together. He was just graduating from college and, uh, we started a band together and that was the start of my, uh, musical career really. And spent a lot of the next 10 years on the road um touring and playing music and playing all kinds of art and it was a really uh beautiful and furtive period in my life yeah i'm sure it was also somewhat cathartic and therapeutic to to, to just have that release uh, from everything else that was that had happened you know and uh i i'm, I'm gonna direct this a little bit because i i unfortunately <laughs> we'll go we're gonna we're gonna talk about some other um, tough things in your life, cool. um, but I promise for you and for the audience we will get to some some good stuff <laughs> as well because um, you have some amazing things going on right now. Um, but from what I understand, you grew up deaf at least the first like part of your childhood. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, did. Yes, um, I was uh, so ninety percent <laughs> deaf. So um, if you uh, any of you growing up watching charlie brown or see the charlie brown reruns the charlie brown in in the school his teacher's voice the wah 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 that's that's what i could i could hear just sort of muffled almost vibrations come in but i had no idea what a I couldn't really distinguish voices or um or certainly not words or anything like that um for how long, how, how, how many years was it before you could actually start to uh, like ascertain what was being said? Um, first got my hearing, I was, I was between four and five. Yeah. Gosh. That's, did you have brothers and sisters? Yeah. Uh, at the time I had one older brother, uh, uh, I have a, uh, bro little brother of six years younger. So my, my brother Adam was, uh, about two years older. Yeah. What? I mean, I know you can't remember much from, but you know, I, I have a, I have a three-year-old and a, an almost mm -hmm. five-year-old. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure they won't remember most of what has happened in the last four years. I'm sure you can't remember a lot, but is there anything palpably you can remember about like what that must have been, what that was like for you? You know, it's interesting. I, I have a lot of memories from that period. Um, I have a lot of, well, um, I have a lot of kind of sense memories like, uh, really strong tactile sensations, really strong, um, like taste and smell memories. Um, um, any you can think of that, that just come to mind. Oh yeah. Like the, I, I would, oh, yeah. I kind of grew up like every Sunday I would go to my grandmother's house and, uh, we, 
my grandparents lived basically on the bottom of a hill that we lived near the top of the hill. Um, and I would, I would tug at my grand, my, my mom and dad to drive me down to grandma and poppy's house on Sunday morning because grandma was cooking the meatballs and I wanted to eat the first meatballs that came out of the pan before they went into the, into the sauce. Right. So I would fry them in olive oil <laughs> and then go into the sauce. And I was like, that is the magical place. So I would go and ask to, you know, help roll meatballs and just be at my grandmother's head. Um, so it's like the, it was like, it's like the smell of the meatballs, like the smell of like, it's almost like the smell of parsley frying in olive oil and like the parsley in the pecorino. Um, I can, I know what that smell and that taste is like. Um, I can, I can blink and it's a hundred percent there. Yeah. Yeah. I have to imagine that has stuck with you for, um, for life as something that you, your, your, your sensory, your ability to sort of, you know, to smell and taste is, is still, um, you, you know, amplified. I, I think so. I, I would like to think so. Uh, it would be nice to think it, to say so as a chef, you know, um, but <laughs> yeah. it's also like that, that feeling there that even like the, the, the memory of like the way the light came in my grandmother's front window. Um, I remember the print on my, my grandmother's house dress and can remember like the smell of the, from the fabric softener they used, you know? Um, and those are all memories of like safety, you know? Um, I was mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Life was kind of chaos for us. My dad, uh, around that time went to prison, uh, was in prison for, uh, like two and a half years. Um, wow. and there was a big dissolution of the family unit. And so like, I have these sense memories that like signify safety to me. And then later in life, later after, after playing music, when I really started cooking, I started to realize that recreating some of these um by cooking i was able to recreate some of these sense memories that harken back to those feelings of safety and that i could access different memories different ways that i didn't know how to before and it was that emotional connection that really drew me into the kitchen yeah yeah so i've been to troy be before it's a pretty beautiful town very quintessential kind of hudson river you know, yeah, says, says um, you, pal. I mean, I, <laughs> well, you know, if you're driving, if you're if you're driving through, I don't know about the yeah. the, the interior of it, but what was it like growing up yeah. in um in a in, in Hudson River Town with an Italian grandmother? Uh, obviously, you have these uh, these memories, but I, I say that sort of beautifulness because I, I live in Hudson River Town as well. But mm -hmm. the, you know, we see we see that, but I'm sure that there's a there's another side to, um. To growing up in, in a town like that, that's, that's, you know, pretty far from the city. Yep. That's, um, you know, what, what was that like growing up for you? Um, I mean, it is, a, it is a stunning town. It is, uh, the, you know, early industrialism, um, had a really beautiful place and impact in Troy and the early architecture of the city and, and like the vast greenness of the place. It's like so lush and so beautiful. And I grew up in this really beautiful old Victorian house, um, like on the way out of Troy and um, on route two. Um, and I had such a strong connection to nature and into that and the town altogether. I loved the way that town part of it, the way, it, uh, felt, uh, I, the way I knew, I know every step of that, you know, uh, I would, I would walk everywhere as a kid. And I, I knew, I felt like I knew every inch of that town, right. And every inch of the woods that I would walk through, um, socially, it was really hard growing up as a deaf kid. Um, and then getting by hearing later men, I had a speech impediment for a long time. I had a really, um, strong lisp and, uh, um, and I had a really hard time connecting uh, socially because of it. And I was kind of a target part of the effects of that post-industrialism town is, um, it's kind of, uh, growing up there is a mean, hard place. Um, people, it was not an atmosphere of openness and welcomeness and, 
acceptance. Uh, it was more an atmosphere of uh, judgment and oppression. <laughs> um, or my experience of it was. Um, and so kids were, you know, kids were mean to each other because their parents were mean to each other. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think it's, I think it's turned towards being a nice place again. Um, but in the 15 or plus years that I was there, I, I would think might have been uh, amongst its worst time in the last couple of hundred years of, or however long it's been a city. Um, it was, it was a mean place to grow up. Um, I have a lot of beautiful memories as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, kids were way meaner to me and to each other than I wish they, they would have been. And, uh, I was really fighting to get out from a early age from like, 12, 13, I was just itching for a way out, which I was motivated me to, uh, I excelled in music, um, uh, oddly as a person that was deaf and then got their hearing, I was like, a had a sort of some preternatural instincts as a drummer, but, um, for some reason I latched onto tennis as the thing that was going to be the, the way out for me. Um, despite nobody in my family playing tennis or having any real connection to it, I latched onto it and committed myself to it. And, uh, it kind of, it kind of did the thing I asked it to do. Yeah. 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 I know, I know that feeling, man. Um, well, look, I know, I know you have at least one daughter mm. because your restaurant is named after, after her, um, Lucinda. Uh, and so I'm curious. I, I have to imagine you have a perspective on this, on the the benefit of adversity, because obviously so so much of that sucks. But you know, grow. I, how has what what is the good that came from that? Because you know, mm. I, you know, you talk about you know the the how difficult it was growing up. I'm you know a lot of people have tough childhoods. Yours seems incredibly tough, um, but I. You know, this is such a, a a tough subject because I I do believe, and now I have two kids, um, that resilience is this thing that like you have to try and instill. And and we we also have cooks, we have team members. You want to try and instill this resilience in folks, and you can't have that without some suffering. Um, what's your perspective on that? Given how much suffering you've had, what do you think that that um, how important is that to building resilience? <laughs> and then how do you actually instill that in your in your and your kids or your team, like respectfully, safely, if you, if you feel like that's important. Yeah. Uh, I mean, from, uh, I guess a macro or like getting into like a kind of more religious sense about it, like from thinking from like a Buddhist perspective, I'm not a Buddhist, but like, I, I love the, uh, the, some of the messaging and, um, suffering brings you closer to God, right? Um, suffering illuminates the, uh, uh, struggles of, um, the, the, the deeper struggles of, of, uh, of mankind connects you to like, a to a, a higher power in some way. So, um, I, I think, a, and another way to say that is like, it brings you great empathy, um, getting through struggles, like getting brings you to like appreciating, um, other humans, like in, in, in mass, like I, I appreciate humanity. I, I, I feel like I have a soft spot for humanity. I want, I want all humans to thrive, not just the ones that are closest to me. Um, um, and I, I feel that because the, the suffering I've experienced kind of opened the door to 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 just want everyone be able to experience peace and my path to finding peace in myself has been like a real journey um so for my kids um yep yeah, my daughter lucy is 14 my my son francis is two um lucy has not had the same struggles um if you were to look on paper like uh it it would seem like 
she's got like a pretty delightful life and her experience thus far is her parents are in a really stable, happy marriage. And, um, she's been, she has not had anything impede on her own success in her life, uh, through injury or illness or, you know, nothing, nothing, seem, no, no, nothing bad has happened. And so do I worry about her sense of resilience? Yes. I do. And so, um, and none that, and, and that said, there's a side to it that we, we talk a lot. I talk, I tell her sort of stories of what it was like for me. Uh, not like, not like, um, from a distance, but like, we'll like, you know, kind of lay in bed next to each other and just talk about it and be like, I want to share this with you because I think it's important for you to have some context. I think she, she's one of the most empathetic people that I've ever met. Um, and she's had small, uh, you know, rejections from different, trying to make this team, trying to do this, trying to, she's been trying to do things that maybe were, she was not totally prepared to make the team or make the cut just yet. Uh, she had not, mm -hmm put in the same time yet some of the other kids had and i see her attitude about it and i see it of like so much wiser than i ever was about it i see it like she's like dad you know it's cool that i tried right like i really just wanted to like she just tried out for the tennis team from middle school she had decided six weeks before and i was like gosh it's you know that's gonna be tough she's like well let's just give it a try and so she and I just played a bunch and I gave her lessons to get her in shape for. Her. And now she's like, well, I didn't make the team, but let's, uh, let's just play more tennis together. So. Well, I mean, that's, that's a great attitude. It's a, it's, you know, I think that's, and, that's a, and, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a blessing. And, but... and so the thing that you and I both, and part of the resilience as it pertains to like discipline and a certain amount of grit that you have to put in to succeed in a life in kitchens. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a very distinct thing, right. That we share and that those, the, when we meet other chefs that, um, we know that have had similar that they've been, they, Oh, you were in this kitchen. The, we, there's a respect among us, not because like, uh, it's a weird fraternity. It's because I know how hard you had to work in order to get to where, where you are. I know how much, how much determination, how much grit it must have taken you to be in that place. So I have an instant admiration and respect by way of empathy for you. Um, that said, I, I, I wondered like the way I, I, I see that the resilience mechanism in my daughter as, uh, she is, she has confidence. She has real confidence, um, by way of things, bad things not happening to her. I wonder about is, is it a false paradigm? The resilience paradigm, you know yeah. what I mean? Is it cause I, I've spent the last 30 years buoying myself by like, no, I'm a tough guy because I can, I can, yeah. I can get over being a disability or being deaf from my dad being in prison or or that my friend's dying or, you know, I can, I can get through that by way of resilience. Um, but would I just be experienced more joy more easily if those things didn't happen? Um, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. It's, I mean, look, I don't think you can experience the level of joy and gratefulness without the other side of, of suffering. I mean, I, you know, I, absolutely. Uh, and, Many of us have it, right? Like I remember cutting weight when I was in wrestling for many, many years and you don't eat for three, four days. And then that first bite you have is nothing tastes better than that, right? And, you know, now I fast for five days because I'm trying to go after that, 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 you know, that, that adversity. And yeah, I think about for, for our kids or even for our team, you know, because cooking is now a very different thing than it was 20 years ago when we started, when you, it was difficult to even find a job, let alone get, you know, get them to, to, you know, to, to bring you in, but you know, there's nothing, there's, there's no way around the fact that 
it gets easier every generation because it's supposed to. But that doesn't mean that, and we have to like protect our kids and our and our and our team from, you know, you know, externally, you know, terrible things. Mm -hmm. And and but I do think that I, I also do think it's sort of incumbent upon us to 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 help them go after mm -hmm. ways to find. This sounds bad, but some 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 form of suffering because look, your daughter is confident and it sounds like she has a great attitude and that's awesome. And she needs to keep that. But at some point she'll do something that she really wants that won't work. Yeah. And that's okay. But I think if you never, if you never, um, experience that, or you never experience like something, something that really, you know, lets you know, like, Hey, not everything in this world is going to work out for you. You can have this expectation that it's supposed to. Yep. And then when it doesn't, you, you, you feel, you know, you feel slighted. You know, it's funny that the CEO of this company called NVIDIA, this big, everybody's talking about this, this, this video. He, he was talking to students at Stanford and basically what he said was high expectations is the easiest way to be unhappy. Yep. Um, this coming from one of the, you know, like the, the largest companies in the world. And yeah, it's, it's so interesting to, you know, I'm hearing you talk about your daughter and, and of course you want to protect her, but at, at, at what part of our job for our kids or for our team is to also find ways for them to see, Hey, guess what? There's also some tough things here yeah. and you should, you should go through that yeah. and fail because we're, it's interesting. We're, we're at a funny little moment right now. Uh, I won't get too deep into it, but she's about to go to high school. We're in a magnet program. Um, and we're getting pushback about the, one of the schools that she got into where she wants to go and whether or not she gets to go there or not certain. Right. Um, and there's a part of me that is, and, and I, I hear you and, and yeah, I want to protect my children with all of, with every bone in my body, every instinct in, in me says protect them. And then the reasonable part of me says protect them, but contextualize it. Like don't protect them blindly. Like if a car was, if I pulled them out of, out of traffic that they're walking into, I don't, I don't say, ah, cool. Let's not let, let's keep going. I say, Hey, I want you to understand what was, a, what, what was about to happening. What was about to happen? What was, um, you know, that our lives were almost totally different, um, at this turn. I, I, I've spent a lot of time talking to Lucy about, about, uh, yeah, the trying to contextualize like what her life is like versus what her mom and I's uh, childhoods and lives were like. But I, I, I want, I want for her, I want to, I want to kind of just like, um, lay it in the simplest, most bare way for her. Like I want to, I, I want to, I want to make sure that she has opportunity um and that she has the opportunity and that you know i want to protect her from monsters you know but i i also yeah. i also yeah. want her to know that monsters are there and there's a point at which i'm not going to be able to protect her from the monsters you know uh what, whatever yeah. they may be yeah. yeah yeah and 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 you know independent of protection Right. And I'm going to try yeah. to, I want to sort of steer this a little bit into, into your restaurant a bit, because I, I know I, I have to imagine this also impacts how you think about, you know, your team, you know, we, we, um, the whole, the whole, like, whenever you hear this, th this message that we tend to say sometimes when we're older of like, oh, in my day, we worked 15 hour days and it was six days a week and doubles and we didn't have this and we didn't have that and da 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 you know, that doesn't work and it does, and no one really cares and they hear it and they're like, yeah, whatever. And that may even be the, the, the case. And that's, you know, that's fine. You know, they, they, they have it, you know, they're supposed to have it easier. Each generation is supposed to have it easier. I mean, before us, I'm sure it was even, even harder, sure. but the beauty in it is that like you, at least I believe that it just means that the bar keeps getting raised of the more things that they can do. And it's our job, um, to force them into new situations that are harder so that they can um, fake fail, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to see that, you know, maybe they, you know, and, and, and you know what, for the interest of, of 
like the um the the, the topics here i'm going to kind of migrate us over to to loco de oro and your team and then just generally kind of like restaurant mm -hmm. teams and cooks and and things like that you know um they don't work the same hours as us they don't um you know you don't have the shift pay and the six days with doubles and they don't have people throwing things at them and th th those things don't happen anymore and that's awesome <laughs> actually you know that's not a that's not a bad For sure thing. um but you know that there was a part of that that built this camaraderie with us and it built you know this um you you know uh, uh sort of going to war with your with your team right and there's also um this this premise of you know you have to spend way more years mastering something than back then than you than you do today and so all of that is true but what do you do now right so they do have more opportunities they do have better working conditions so what's the new thing that we can sort of impress upon th these you know th these younger folks to help them like raise the bar even more I, I don't know what it is but i'm curious if you think about that you know you have your daughter and your and your and your kids but like you also have a team of cooks mm -hmm. i remember this one the, peter used to the, was a young cook worked for me and now and then he went and worked for you and things on his own but like you have a lot of young cooks going through your kitchen right like what how do you think about that um mainly i i i, I agree with the the paradigm you presented is one i i think about every day and um i don't but i don't i don't feel in in some ways i feel i feel sorry or badly for them that um they don't have context of um the grit that it once took to be in a kitchen and how hard you or i might have uh needed to work or hustle to get to just get an opportunity um and that they can walk into you know one of the best restaurants in their town and be like you know i'm can I have a job? And we're like, yeah, of course you can have a job. <laughs> Come, on Come on in. Come on in. Um, um, the very, but very distinctly, like the way I think about it is, oh, you have more, you have more intellectual space because you are not being the part of you having to earn this in that way is unfettered. You don't have to earn it the same way. You don't have to grit it out. So that part of your brain is more accessible. So um, the thing that I can instill is that in my kitchens, you need to be more empathetic to su succeed. The 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 better listener you are, the more progress you're going to get. The um, the the more empathy you are very clearly showing to all the cooks around you to the rest of the team around you um that is, your success is tied to that right is and all the technical markers are uh of achievement as a cook or uh go along with that but i i feel like if you're becoming a good cook is becoming a good listener right it's like you have to be present for the process if you're present for the process, less is going to go wrong. And so I don't think it's uh, that different, but I, I've i framed it very differently to to my staff, uh, to my teams, in terms of what their markers of success are. Um, uh, because I think our generation didn't have room for that. Um, but I, I realized that being more present is kind of the, the thing that we're all of us have been after throughout throughout history right is trying to show up and be the be able to fully be present for the environment that you are be in that moment uh and this generation has an opportunity to embody more of that more accessibly uh and i think that's the thing that i'm trying to coach into them yeah yeah it's 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 tough they you know it there's no, there's no way around it. It will always get a little, you know, those things will start to get, you know, easier and things get unlocked. There is, you know, there's a great book by Robert Caldini called, um, um, principles of persuasion, but it's basically yeah. about, about that. One of them is the, is the scarcity principle. And, you know, there's a parable about, um, fraternities and why, you know, fraternities have this hazing, you know, ritual and the importance of it. And the most important 
aspect of this, of course, you don't want people to be, you know, hurt or anything like that, is that because you have to go through this, um, through this experience and because not everybody can get in you, you, mm. you, um, and you have this adversity, you appreciate it so much more. Whereas if you just got in uh, and they actually did a test, you know, it, you just don't appreciate it as much. And I don't know if there is an impact of new, you know, I, there's a lot of young cooks that love what they do and are, and are really talented. Uh, so I don't know if there's any, if there's an impact, but historically speaking, and based on science, it seems like there probably is some sort of impact of because there's less um, of a um, of a roadblock to actually get in. I mean, you you couldn't even stage at Le Bernardin in 2000, you know, no uh, let alone get a yeah. job. Now I'm sure you're just walking in and get it. Um, there has to have some sort of impact on 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 the 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 appreciation of of the industry when you when you can just kind of get any job you want. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, and I think it's like the it's like the the the, the parable of the the gauntlet. Like as you present, I think is a real one. And how do we create that? In um, I just try to I just try to create a different gauntlet, right? Like, um, it's like yes, I you're you're all like um, the atmosphere for hiring is a different one, um, and the way we hire is totally different. I at Locadoro, I hire. Uh, uh, almost exclusively for um, personalities that are going to be a great cultural fit for for how we communicate together. Is this person going to work in the room? Yeah. And if if it's a yes, mostly I've been like, it doesn't matter if they are um, if they've been if they have they've worked for four Michelin stars or if they've never picked up a knife in their life. Um, the cooking is the easy part in a way that teaching them to be the kind of human that will thrive in the environment that we're, uh, professing to foster, uh, is, is, is a little more challenging. Um, the gauntlet that we run is like, can you, can you show up and be the best of yourself? And the way that the yeah. way that we ask that of them, it's um, it's a lot of individual time, a lot of individual coaching, and um, kind of asking a group of people that are all of all of disparate levels to to make a menu every day. To at Locadoro, like we're making the menu from scratch every day. Um, you have to show up and be great every day, and so. Uh, there is a time, and if it, this is 25 years ago in New York, where that kind of kitchen, like we know, we, we, I have a bunch of assassins on the line that all they, all they know how to mm -hmm. do is this, right? These people yeah. are, are showing up. They don't have that level. Of, they don't have the same skin in the game necessarily, right? And they don't ha necessarily have the same technical expertise. But what I'm asking them to do is very similar. So the gauntlet is mm -hmm. is getting is getting from A to Z, despite that. Um, and so there's no shaming. There's no like, you know, not shaming people. There's there's a high rate of failure. Is what I'm saying. Um, yeah, yeah. And I welcome I yeah. I welcome that failure. Um, on yeah. the daily because yeah. that's how they learn. Yeah, you know. Another thing that you that you said um, that I wanted to sort of ask you about, you said you wanted to, and I think a lot of people can can relate to this. You said you wanted to get techniques and ideas out of your system so you can get back in touch with you know where your where your soul lives, right? You grew up with an Italian grandmother cooking, and you, that's the food that you know and love. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we go to restaurants and we have you know technically perfect food. It doesn't really make us super excited. And then you have, you know, go to a restaurant where it's technically not perfect at all, but it's delicious. And, you know, in the same way that like a guitarist can you do amazing arpeggios and be a technically, technically like amazing at scales, still might make music that is not enjoyable yeah. to us. The, the same thing exists in the kitchen, but you kind of have to have both. I'm curious for you, like you definitely are instilling a lot more of sort of like the, the soul of cooking, but you, technically know a lot about cooking how do you um how do you balance that 
technique and so with in a professional kitchen where you have to have people execute at, at somewhat of a consistent level and your that your customers can expect mm. and still technically be proficient but also instill that yeah. soul in in that you're trying to get out of the vision of your of your, of your restaurant i found that i have a like a series of specific recipes that help that help tell that narrative and that when a canoe cook comes in they i know that they're going to make um my tomato jam it's going to be the the first thing that they make and the reason is is because it it balances um some sort of fine technical cooking with um uh, a high degree of presence necessary for the last stage of it um and uh uh, and it, it it needs some instinct and it takes some conversation to get through their recipe. It's a very simple recipe, yeah. but it's uh, adding a, we're ad adding a stabilizer, laying the game. And the big part of it is the tomatoes. We cook the tomatoes until they're just about to burst, right? Cooking cherry tomatoes whole, mm -hmm. um, making basically an agridolce, making a syrup, and then cooking the tomatoes in that syrup until just shy of 180 degrees at 180 degrees the t a tomato wants to burst at 174 yeah. it doesn't um yeah and so we want to um stop the cooking right when it's almost like when you uh when you're making popcorn you're listening for that first kernel to pop mm -hmm. when you're yep. making the uh, my tomato jam it's like looking for that first tomato to pop and then you're shutting you're shutting the heat give it a few minutes and then we decide three minutes after that how many hundredths of a gram of the stabilizer we add uh relative to what is it like xanthan or pectin we're or just something? using xanthan and it's and it's and yeah. it's uh it's relative to the amount of pectin that was in that collective of tomatoes in that batch right yeah and so you have to you're just you know you have to uh take a spatula and and, and swipe and see how much of a line it's leaving before mm -hmm. you add it. So it's a, it's a simple recipe, but it requires a good deal, deal of intuition to get right. And, uh, I teach it first because that's, it's a good example of how I want to shape their cooking journeys with us is where I'm going to teach you technique. I'm going to teach you, um, different techniques that may be familiar, may not be, but, um, some of these things are, are, are tricky to learn and it, and the hardest part is just paying attention um yeah and yeah and that's the you know some some of the best some of the best recipes require that you know like the bricks level will change on something you know throughout the year and 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 the tannin level and and yeah no matter how how prescriptive you are some of that is it, that, that's what makes you know a, a, a great cook someone that can that can understand that yeah it's funny that it's you know just randomly by the way that that's how I make all of my marmalades like my strawberry or any berry basically like I can't stand when people cook down berries because they all taste exactly the same if you cook them down to sec so I, I I do the same exact thing with like strawberries like peak seasons like if you get perfect tri-star strawberries you know the worst thing you can do is just cook them down to yeah. to sec because then they just taste like you know like every other strawberry just cook them till they barely um, you know, just barely warm through. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you do have to have some sort of stabilizer, whether it's pectin or xanthan or something to. Right. But it's, a, I mean, I made this, I made that tomato jam recipe, like from, from a, a marmalade recipe, right? Like I adapted yep. it from that because cool. it is that same idea of what is the way to, the, the goal is, and this is, uh, and a, another reason I use that recipe first at Locadoro's who are we as an Italian restaurant? What is what what is the story that we're trying to tell? Where a lot of the technique is not Italian, and uh, uh, and ascribing technique to provenance is kind of a a, uh, a zero sum game, mm -hmm. anyways. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's it's what's wonderful about the principle of Italian cooking is um, uh, celebrating simple ingredients, right? And so all the technique that we use at Loka is based around that very simple principle 
of how do we shine the light on this thing. So in the tomato jam, it's like these mini San Marzano tomatoes that are grown in West Texas. Um, when they're great, they're really great. And how do we, how do we, how do we shine the brightest star on them? And what is the least interventive way to, to like highlight them? Um, and that's yeah. how I think about, that's what I love about cooking all together. That's my, I mean, that's like my soul in the kitchen is, is that, that credo all together. I, I, for years, like I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this done so I can get a job at Alinea so I can learn these techniques because that's going to lead me to my next, uh, that's going to open doors for me. But I, I, I was thinking about it kind of backwards that the techniques were going to open doors for me. The techniques are a subjective set. It's like, um, it's a, a sub subjective set of, it's, it's kind of like different colors of paint, right? Or different. Yeah. Just a toolkit that you, right. Like, uh, there's an appropriate toolkit for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. and I, Elvin, uh, Elvin Jones, the drummer, uh, uh, once, uh, told me when I was a teenager, he's like, what do you got all those, what do you got all those drums for? You only need three of them, you know? Um, and often it, it's true. It's true with, with everything like the doing the doing, working with the simplest toolkit. And being thoughtful within that is a real place of confidence. Um, yeah. And, and after learning a lot of different techniques and trying a lot of different things, trying a, a lot of different restaurants and on for size and, 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 and working there, I, like I realized what culturally what's important to me and technically where I have a voice. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I have this, um, for me, like the, the things that we make, you know, in, in, in the kitchen, I, I look at this sort of like hierarchy of what, why we, why we make them. Right. So like you first cook for yourself right? because you, you love to do it. And then hopefully you cook for the, I don't know if it's in, in, in this order, but like you cook for yourself and then you cook for the ingredient. Right. And then you cook for Meaning like you, you, you appreciate the ingredient, like this thing at the peak season or because you love blue crab and there's a way to, you know, enjoy that versus Jonah crab versus snow crab. And then you cook for the team, meaning like you have to have some techniques involved so that they learn and they get, you know, inspired, yeah. um, by more than just the ingredients. And then you cook, of course, for the customer, right? Because you have to have an experience that the customers like want to go there versus somewhere else and wants to cut, leave home for this thing. And then some folks cook for the betterment of the industry, right? Like you're sort of innovating to a place where, hey, these are net new things that 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 um that that, that we should learn, and not many folks do that. That's and that's that that's the nomas and the, and and, th and things like that. That's a very difficult thing. Um, but that that spectrum, I feel like it's okay to sort of you know over index on any one of mm -hmm. those. Um, but I'm with you, man, on the on the on the ingredient piece of like you know like I love it when someone tells me I I hate asparagus and then i'm just gonna go t totally ham on oh yeah well you know you probably have like you know and, and go and go after it and i think that's one of the most beautiful things about cooking mm -hmm. is when you just you know you you just focus on like let me highlight this thing it's in perfect season it's the perfect christmas like what texture should it be what's like the le least amount of things that i can add to it to make it delicious yeah i feel like uh a lot of people tell me like um Oh man, I, 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 over the last, you know, uh, Locadoro, my first restaurant has been around for, you know, eight years now. We just opened a, a, a new place, uh, called Bambino, uh, pizza, a pizza joint. We opened two weeks ago. But, oh, wow. What kind of oven are you using? Uh, a pizza master. Nice. Um, what style of, of pizza or, or is it multiple styles? It's a, it's a one style and it's a hybrid. It's a crispy bottomed, uh, very wide, fluffy edge, wide cornichone. Um, so it's a hybrid of the kind of the way I'm thinking about it is like the, the Tokyo manifestation of Neapolitan pizza that has gotten like really hyperbolic with the edge, um, where it's beautifully custardy. Um, but there's a 
I love like a little bit of crackle crispness to the bottom of a piece of pizza. Mm -hmm. That is magic to me. So it was combining those worlds, which was, uh, we spent the last two years working on trying to find a, find a way into it. We're in a pretty good spot. Is there some bread, is there some bread flour in there? Is it, it's, um, like what, you, what kind of flour are you using? We're using, it's all organic flour. Um, it's, it's pretty high, uh, protein, but not crazy high. And there's a meld of like four different flours. Um, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a three day fermented, um, but yeast added at, you know, starter, Biga, then starter, and then fresh yeast added. So yeast added three different yeah. stages. Awesome. Yeah. Well, next time I'm in Austin, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely have to <laughs> check it out. What? So do you have, did I read you have a, like a, a cheese production too? Oh, I, I started a, a water buffalo creamery and dairy, um, uh, started then 2020, um, yeah, and I I traveled. Uh, got to travel to a lot to Italy to work in cheese factories and do research for that. And um, working with a, a a pal here and a, and a rancher. After in two, 21, uh, as we were getting the sh- the retail shop open, and I was just working on developing the mozzarella. It was right when we were getting Locadoro back open after being shut down for a year and a half. Um, and uh, it turned into a joyless time trying to do both. Um, so I gave up my interest in the the in the dairy. Um, gotcha. Yep. It's a yeah. That's a, I mean, it sounds like you spent some time in Italy looking at those at those dairies. I, there, there's some. It's such an amazing culture of building cheese over there. I remember um, visiting in, in outside of Parma mm-hmm. uh, this Valserina Solo de Bruno, which is one of the oldest Parm farms, and and like. One of the coolest things that I didn't think about, <laughs> that most of the folks that are making the cheese on these farms, or at least on this particular farm, um, were Hindu. Yeah. And, and it was because they have this incredible respect for the cow. Yeah. And they also don't, don't drink, which is, you know, helpful. Um, but it was like blew my mind that, like, wow, that's so smart. And they love making this cheese, and it's incredible cheese. And there's such a a, a cool world of all the ways in which cheese are, are produced in Italy. You know, yeah. Of course, everywhere in the world there there is, but I I mean I love the maybe one day I love the culture of honoring the animal. Um, da- I mean, uh, I feel really complicated about uh, dairy and the dairy industry because it's true. It's like you go to um, <laughs> Uh, um, that there's a, there's there's some very fancy like water buffalo farms out in Campania, outside of Naples, um, where it's like there is a tannery, and uh, you know you walk in and they, um, you get a, a tour and the host is saying, we only play a Beethoven for for the animals that's all they listen to that's how they respond to it <laughs> they, this is the life they live and they're and like the the water buffalo are just like clean they're like supermodels of you know they're just sparkling and clean they do a, a wonderful job but um it doesn't it doesn't paint the whole picture because i mean the question i asked when i was there i was like this is wonderful what happens to the boys they like, oh uh is uh you know they say it's a different uh, you know <laughs> and I was like I was like oh there's there's a there there's a lot of carnage uh, associated with with dairy to to make it happen yeah. like um, there's a lot of great work that's been done with uh, sexed um, semen samples to 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 control breeding so that if you're trying to breed cows that you're mostly breeding female uh cows so there's uh less death associated in the process but ethically i feel really complicated about it um because if um i worry and some of the nicest places that i've been don't have an ethical plan for the male the male animals that are born or or the plan that they do have in place is pretty inhumane and pretty atrocious but 
it is not part of the narrative and it's not part of the story that's told about them. Yeah. And yeah. I was I was wondering as you were saying that about the um the 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 Hindu uh population that is working on, on the Darian Parma, how they reconcile that problem from a from a religious standpoint. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to figure yeah. that out. It's tough, man. I mean, you know, like, uh, every, there, there isn't, as, as soon as you start, like, scaling agriculture, I mean, you, you go to an avocado farm in California, every squirrel and rabbit and insect has been murdered in order to grow that avocado or that almond. And, you know, there's, it's, it's, yeah. it's tough to get around. I think, you know, you have to kind of, you know, pick, pick your battles. That's right. And there's not a place where you can just grow you know, everything in, I mean, we can't grow avocados in New York. Um, you know, so, so there's, there's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. That's a, that's, a, that's another episode. <laughs> yeah. There, there is a, <laughs> but, but, yeah. um, you know, I had a, I had awesome, I had, we had some, obviously some super delicious food in Locador. Now, now I realize whatever we ate that day was completely different the next day. So I didn't, so I didn't, I didn't know that, but, um, you know, what's, um, can you tell me a little bit about like, and I want to make sure I'm sensitive to your time. We're about an hour and a, hour and a quarter, so we'll, we'll wrap up soon here. But um, the Austin scene has changed a bunch, yeah. right? So you 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 opened Locadora like eight years ago. Um, you just opened up a new spot. How has sort of this influx of you know all these folks, the tech folks and 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 enter, entertainment folks coming from from all over, moving to the city? Um, like, how how has the scene changed? Um, over the last decade, not not just in terms of like the 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 food that's there, but the culture and the community. Because I've seen a big, you know, change uh, from an outside perspective. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the real estate's insane. Um, but what what have you seen? Be you know, having been there for you know for for so long. Um, one the the cultural the culture for professionalism has really like jumped up in in the higher. In the, there's, um, you know, there's a group of, of restaurants and of chefs that, uh, recognize in each other that they care. Um, uh, and that, and, and that some, some of us care about the same thing. Um, this kind of relates a little bit to, uh, our, the nonprofit that we helped start Good Work Austin. Uh, I'll get, I can get into that in a minute. Um, Part of it is like in, in terms of the scene, like um, the the quality and 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 like like uh, sort of cultural and ethnic distinction of different foods uh, is really off the charts. Um, the level of different kinds of service that you're able to um, uh, witness, be a part of, um, is is wildly different than when we got here um and the the community you know when i i talked to phil spear about this sometimes because when i you know i walked in staged at uh uchiko when i was not at, which had just opened uh the year that i was moving here and he, he will he will he's quick to tell me that they had a really tight, tight knit network of cooks then. Um, and I feel like there's a new generation of, uh, of cooks that have uh, really banded together. And, and, and the, I think the value system has, has changed. Um, what the issues that we're talking about, um, uh, the way that we communicate, the, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in conversation, having coffee, uh, <laughs> hanging out, playing tennis with a lot of different, a, a lot of my friends are, are, are chefs, um, and, and, and restaurant owners and the community around it is something I am so wildly grateful for. Um, anyways, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely seems like the, the, the community has changed a bunch and it's way more close knit than than it's ever been. Um, I'm sure that, that yeah, 
that's that's one side of it. It's one side of it. It's like great and it's close. And the other side is it's created an environment where it, it seems like it's a great idea to open restaurants here. <laughs> right. And it's not, it's, it's generally, it's generally not generally, uh, 80% of the people that are opening restaurants should not be. Um, and there's a lot of money. There's a lot of kind of like funny tech money, uh, around somebody's vanity project will open. Um, and we're, it's a little saturated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, that comes out in the wash. You know, I mean, I think it, restaurants are, are are the great equalizer. You know, you <laughs> it either is going to work or it's not, and it's not always because it's good food or not good food or good service or not good service. Um, but yeah. you know that that it, 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 you learn quickly whether it's going to work or not. That's right. Um, well, cool, man. I mean, I'm curious, like you know, um, what 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 does the next you know three, four, five years look, look like for you? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I've been, uh, I'm, you know, we have this new baby in Bambino, um, that, uh, we have really high hopes for, um, that we're really excited about. Um, um, I, I, I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm really curious to find out what it's able to do, what it's reaches going to be um kind of like using pizza as a egalitarian food to connect people um how far does that uh further connect us with uh with, with in community in austin and and what does that mean for us um do you yeah does that mean you're thinking about you know if it works you want to scale it to to, to more locations or uh yeah that's definitely possible yeah um but I, I, I wouldn't want to jump to that um, until I know uh, until I, I know that's a good idea. It's like the soul of a place is the most important thing, right? Yeah. Um, and and replicating a soul, um, we have not figured out how to make that work. Replicating a concept that is soulful and having a team that is built up to do it again, that sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's so true, uh, man. It's, it's, you know, I think it's, it's easy to look at, re at restaurants as a sort of mechanical beast to then replicate. And I think that's usually when it goes wrong. I mean, look, there's a lot of other things that can go wrong totally. when you try to go from one to two locations of something. Uh, every problem scales. But, you know, it's, it, you know, Danny Meyer, I remember him you know, screaming this from the rooftops very often early on and you see it in his in his restaurants and it and you see the same thing with even something like sweet cream, right? Like you gotta first like build something that people love and that you love and that you can put your finger on why. Why? And then you can decide whether it's worth, you know, scaling. And I think oftentimes what happens is you start making some money and you just multiply that and say, hmm, or you're not making money, but you think if you multiply it, you will. <laughs> and, and then right, that's which, how things scale. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, I, um, I mean, Locadoro has been like a wonderful kind of institution in town now for, for eight yeah. years. And I'm, I'm just now learning how to be a good, good. My new, my new job is like, a is as a restaurateur. It's like being between both, both restaurants, uh, balancing and booing both teams and being very present for both entities. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about that challenge. Um, and, and I have to every day, like, you know, I woke up today and I was like, you know, I think about that, that, that Denny Meyer quote all the time. It's that one's embedded in me and think about why look has been around for eight years. It is, um, keeping things fresh is hard, right? Um, uh, both internally and to the outside. And um, what today am I going to focus on that's special and beautiful about this place? And how am I going to talk to the team about it? And and how do I want that to manifest to where the our, our guests are going to find out about that special thing, right? That's my challenge for today. 
um, I think about that as that's the kind of challenge that I uh, set up myself up for every day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also, I'm also, I've been writing a book. Um, oh, no shit. That's I've cool. been, I've been working on a memoir for the last uh, little bit. Um, and uh, writing stories. And I'm, you know, when I, I was harkening back to your question a couple months ago about like the next three, four or five years, like, um, I want to get in a place where I can share a lot of the stories that are in there are stories that I've shared with my friends, my family, and a lot with my team. Um, um, and I, I want to get those stories out in the world and share that with, with the, with the public. And, yeah. um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that I have a part of my next chapter is in, in, in celebrating that. I love that. Well, I mean, just here today <laughs> in the hour or so that we've been chatting, the, 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 the story, I didn't know half of these stories and they're so um, compelling and interesting. I want to learn more. So I, I'm, I'm excited to, to, to hear, <laughs> to hear more about the book when it comes out, man. Um, Thanks, Josh. Parting question for you. I don't mm. know if you think about this and you know what? You could just say, you know, I don't think about this, but I think about it uh, sometimes. Uh, as a fun little like exercise for myself, but um, you know, if you had unlimited capital, unlimited resources, you know, what are you not doing today that you would do? Um, given that if you had, you know, the, as much capital and resources and time as you needed to do it, are there things that you're not doing today that are simply a limit of the amount of time and capital you have? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Number one would be the way I take care of my body. Um, I am, I'm, I'm envious of those that like put their body first. Um, and that's a, the natural order of things for them. For me, it feels like the, my family needs me, the team needs me. Um, and these are at like the top of the pyramid and I put my, my mental health at the top of the pyramid the last couple of years. And that's been really helpful mm -hmm. putting my sort of like addressing just my, my physical health, my physical well being. I've had a really hard time putting, making that a priority. And it's, it, it feels like it's a, a function of, of time, right? Uh, I need more time. I need to buy myself more time. Yeah. Um, that's the, 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 Easy number, number one that comes up. I mean, I, I I know I know what you mean so much. It's so tough. I mean, we 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 both have two kids. It's like you wake up early, they're up early. You know, you work all day and you come home for them, and then you're with them, and you go to bed, and then maybe you get some more work done, and then you you do it all over again. And I I always struggle with working too much. And then, Same. you know, I had obviously a wife and then kids and I'm like, oh my gosh, now I have even less time. And for a very long time, honestly, Fiore, up until like very recently, and I mean like in the last like two months, I don't, and you know, took some, some therapy and some talking to some other like, you know, friends, I just never put any side, any time aside for myself. I would even, I'd put it on the calendar, but still not do it. And it was because I was just like, no, I, I, I can't. Um. I mean, I would, yeah. I, I've always, I've always like exercised and woke up early to exercise, but the, the mental health part and other things like I just never did. And even now, like thinking about my kids, like, you know, I'm there for them before school, after school, but there are things I would miss, you know, I'd miss like picking them up for a certain thing or like a, a, a an appointment they have. And my wife would do that. And like, for some reason, I don't know what clicked, but recently I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to, if I miss a half day of work, let's see what happens. <laughs> let's see what happens if I just take an hour out and it before I could just never do it. And, um, it's been a couple months now. I gotta be honest, man. I think I'm more productive. <laughs> I think I'm Probably. actually more productive and happier and I have less guilt. And I don't think it's, you know, like I have to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, like not all of us own our businesses where we can make our own hours and kind of do things kind of how we, you know, we want. And also I'm sensitive to like, as a restaurateur, you have less flexibility there. Right. But, um, I, you know, 
there's 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 something to that and part of it i think is also like you know having an accountability person to say hey did you do that today did you, did you take care of yourself did you um i i started this app called copilot basically like a personal trainer remotely it's fine the personal trainer part but just knowing that somebody like knows whether i worked out or not is is kind of yep. nice um but i know what you're going through man it's 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 tough i will say i think you probably do have the time and you and you just got to like, you know, there's going to be something else that has to get, get given up. But I, I wonder if like totally. you tested it out, if it would still be, you know, still work out. I, I, I know that it's there. I know that it's, it's really just a mental reordering of it. Right. Yeah. Um, you, I mean, the, the truth is like, and, and yes, like we're, I think we're both blessed in having the kind of autonomy that we have in our lives. Um, um, and with that, like, I recognize I can really do anything that I want, right? Um, if I if it's what I really want, and I true, I I I mean this uh, like as a on an existential level, we can, any of us can do anything we want. There's a cost. Yeah, it's 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 not free. Um, there's a cost to trying. There's a cost to uh, achieving, um, and there's some suffering in, <laughs> involved in that. Um, but that I, I think maybe getting back to your first question or the first thing we talked about is, uh, maybe the, the greatest thing that suffering teaches you is that, um, is that, you know, that, you know, what, how the math works, right? Um, you're like, I, I already know what it feels like to suffer. Uh, am I willing to suffer to try to find the, to try to move, you know, climb this next mountain? Yeah. And generally the answer is yeah. Generally the answer is like the, what's on the other side of suffering is, is joy for achievement and appreciation for like a, a, a greater, deeper appreciation for life. So let's go get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, and I think, you know, the thing to that we all have to remember, you and I, especially, and anybody in this scenario, is it can very quickly um, sort of bleed into this notion that we should just be suffering. And <laughs> when we're having fun, uh oh, wait a second, no, nah, this isn't this isn't right. And I think that's the part, you know. And I'm, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm 42, almost 43. Like we're we're probably close, close and close in age. We're like, wait a second, mm -hmm. we're only 50 soon. It's okay to have fun. It's okay, maybe you know, and and even on a Tuesday, you know, what? Wh why not? And yeah. you know, we we spend our whole <laughs> lives as cooks or whatever else we're doing, like just working maniacally all the time, and life goes by. And I think actually, it's it actually feels like more of a risk, um, to do that than than not. But I'm I'm at least for myself, I'm trying more and more to like put that out there because, you know, I I think that maybe it will actually just mean things will continue no matter what, even if we're, even if I'm actually having fun outside of work or something. Yeah. The, like, um, yeah, we remove, uh, kind of removing the ego from the equation of like, are they going to be okay with them? Yeah. Yeah. They're going to be fine. And, and, and sometimes getting out of the way, even just for an afternoon, um, leaves room for somebody else to experience and learn more than they might have that day. Um, and so long as you come back and you're there to support and you ask the questions and you like, Hey, what did you learn when I wasn't there? Um, those are, you, you're often paving the way for more full experiences yeah, as a leader. Yeah. Well, Fiora, this was awesome. Um, I really appreciate you, uh, not only taking time to, to chat, but opening up and, and sharing some of these stories. Um, it was really, really, um, just heartfelt and, and I'm grateful that I got to, to, to hear more about your background. Um, I'm stoked to come to Austin again soon and, and, and check out your new spot. Um, yeah, so thank you. And let's go, let's go have some fun. <laughs> I would love to go have some fun with you. I, I, I got some ideas. Well, um, uh, well, I hope to see you soon. And thanks so much for having me. This is uh, a really uh, uh, awesome podcast. Uh, I, I love listening to it. And um, thanks so much for taking the time and having me on. For sure, man. <laughs>